Can you beat every temple in Tears of the Kingdom without abilities? There are five temples in the game, and just like the shrines, they intend for us to press L. While simply avoiding the L abilities is the premise of the run, I'm also going to see how many times we can avoid the Sage abilities. I would rule them off entirely, but unfortunately the terminals don't respond to anything except their corresponding Sage. As for everything before the Sage quest, you can check out my All Shrines No Abilities video where I cover the Great Sky Island among other things. With the rules set, let's begin! Temple number one for this run is the Wind Temple. The quest to get to Lid is done completely normally. We covered how to get through the sky towards the temple in my All Shrines run, but in short, we can use springs and paraglide between most islands. There is one place where you need a sin, but activating a hoverstone and using Octoblooms will raise it up, letting us get up. With the spring trick, this means we don't need to use Tulin at all for the rest of the journey to get to the Wind Temple. Honestly, I expected a bit more resistance getting up, but now that we've unlocked the terminals, let's get to them. To start, there's a set of levers where you need Ultra Hand, but Octobloons and Bombs can move them. Unfortunately, this first one was quite stubborn for me though, so I wound up needing to smack it with a heavy weapon until the door opened. You might think the one without a handle is problematic, but it actually went all the way with just an Octobloon and a Bomb. This opens up the door to the first terminal, and with Tulin's ability, I unlocked number one. The next terminal is covered by these doors, and while getting up to them is easy enough, I couldn't seem to open these no matter what I tried. I found out it was possible to use bombs to ragdoll Link between the gap, but for some reason it always pops Link back out. So I decided to approach this differently. Technically the underside is open. With that knowledge, we can get underneath it by dropping onto a wing. From here, a well-timed spring shield off the wing makes it possible to float up through the fan and access Terminal 2. For Terminal 3, there's another one under the ship, but this one is quite simple and can be paraglided to with no special tricks. Back into the interior of the ship, there's a gap that's frozen over and we can easily pass by climbing up the wall then gliding over. Climbing up another wall gives access to a gear that needs to be turned. Alright, how are we gonna turn this one? It's not like bombs or octobloo- Oh, octobloons can solve it. Well, I expected that one to be a lot more difficult, honestly. With Terminal 4 down, one left, and we run into similar problems. A gear with whatever those are, but climbing the wall is the solution once again. And just when you think Octobloons would work again, they do. Just this time I needed 5 instead. This unlocks the door to Terminal 5, and then we can fight the Kolgara and complete the temple. You know, that was surprisingly easy. I was expecting more out of the temples. Maybe too, the Lightning Temple will prove more difficult. The quest to open it starts off pretty normally, and we don't need Riju's ability to take down the Gibdos. Elemental damage of any kind will take them down, and for the Hives, bombs can actually knock them down. Despite the town defense focusing on her ability, it's totally possible to move from all three sides and knock the Hives down with just bombs to save Gerudo without her lightning. The quest then tells us to set up some lights in the desert. Light 1 can be cleared with just a bomb, and for Light 2, there was never an ability requirement to raise the pillar. For number 3 though, there's no handles and we're intended to use abilities unlike the other two. It does happen to rotate sometimes when you hit it with a heavy weapon though, and this lets us put it into position. With the temple unlocked, we finally have our first need for Riju. See, bombs won't crack the hive for the queen, and the only way to open it is with her lightning. That said, the fight itself can be done using any elemental damage to break the queen's armor, and then normal damage will take her down. As soon as we enter the temple, we find a bunch of piles of sands that need to be blown away. Unlike shrines, we can drop Zonai devices inside of temples, meaning a quick fan's breeze can knock these away easily and allow entry to the inside. A bit further in, there's a flaming rolling ball we need to get past. As a circular object, what shaped hallway should it go in? That's right, a square hole. <laughs> Our only other impedance in getting to the main chamber is this light, but with a mirror shield, we can slowly walk backwards while holding it to power the door. Now that we can unlock the main pedestal, let's get started by octoblooning this rock off the wind shaft. With the updraft, the top room with light is accessible, the issue is just directing it out. I tried stacking some Zonai devices to make a pedestal for the mirror, and while a bit janky, it actually did work. From here, octobloons can slowly move these statues, but rockets will make faster work to get them into place. With chamber 1 unlocked, the constructs inside can be taken down, and then we're left needing to direct the light up. First, reflect the light forward, then knock a mirror over to get it going upwards. With a spring, we can get up and then a mirror shield can unlock the door for pedestal number one. For number two, we can reposition the statues on top to redirect the light, then dive into the locked chamber for an easy pedestal. 
For Terminal 3, Fishman in my chat have figured out something cool. If you reload, the Zonai devices we placed earlier will despawn, but apparently the game places the intended blocks under the top mirror even if we never used abilities to set them up. After moving the statues back to the original spot for Pedestal 1, we can glide down to estimate the position the light needs to be in. After landing in position, drop a hoverstone and activate it with a mirror on top. Octobloons will slowly pull it up until the mirror and light are lined up and can open room number 3. Inside, we've got some traps, but they can be dealt with easily by dropping Zonai devices in between them. Once in the bottom, we can simply hold a mirror to open up the light to the top. From here, we can complete the pedestal completely as intended. The last terminal is arguably the easiest one, but I totally forgot about it until I did the other three. Spot a cannon to blast open the wall, then you can grab the last pedestal and unlock the elevator to the boss. As for the Gibdo Queen, we do need Riju's ability to spawn the boss, but the strats for the opening fight mean we can totally do this boss without her lightning. Though as a quick note, if you throw stuff at the Queen and break her armor, you can jump up with a spring and use bows to deal massive amounts of damage in short periods of time. And just like that, we've got two temples down. Up next for number 3 is Death Mountain and the Fire Temple, which begins by fighting Unibo. Beating him is done completely normally, but we're going to have to use his ability to escape the cave. I did try to clip out, but the game eventually told me I couldn't go any further and slipped me back into bounds. It's not against the rules, but it would have been cool to leave without using his ability. The next quest event has us climbing Death Mountain and entering a boss fight, and while it might seem like we need to use Ultra Hand to free this wing, Octobloons can fish it out. Once again, we resort to Unibo's ability to beat the boss and then head down to the depths and temple itself. After the descent, we finally get a place where we can skip a use of Unibo's ability. There's a boulder blocking the door to the start of the temple, but we can totally just go around and then we get a cutscene which mysteriously removes the boulder without him hitting it. Strange, huh? As for navigating the temple, springs, climbing, and paragliding will get us pretty much everywhere without needing the cards. As for Terminal 1, I picked the one with the lava and ramp. Normally you'd use Ultra Hand to change its direction, but as it turns out, it's totally possible to launch Unibo into the gong without moving it. As for Terminal 2, it's blocked by a boulder and we can't directly hit it with Unibo. However, spawning a wing is enough to send Unibo flying and crashing into the boulder. From here, we can glide over, then climb up and drop down to the gong, unlocking another lock. For gong number 3, it's not really an issue either, as we can use springs to avoid the rail puzzle and splash fruit across the lava. Once across, Unibo can hit the gong like normal. Gong 4 is barely worth mentioning, as the only thing blocking us is height, and dropping a spring makes quick work of that issue. For the last terminal, we have a rock blocking the door, and Unibo can't be launched across. A couple of wings are once again enough to solve this issue and knock out the last gong. Honestly, this temple has been pretty underwhelming so far. As for Big Bad Goma, you might think we need Unibo to break his legs, but we could just spring up and hit him in the eye with a bow and clear him in quite literally under one minute, making Unibo's temple the easiest so far. Although easy is definitely not the case for the water temple and oh man do we need to talk about this one. The quest to the Water Temple starts off easy as we can clear mud with Splash Fruit, but then we get tasked with finding Giotto and the start of our issues are here. Finding him is easy, but we need to retrieve a slab, and wouldn't you know it, you can't move it without Octobloons. Or can you? It turns out that physics are just completely disabled until you interact with Ultra Hand or Recall, and no items or Zonai devices will work with it. Really gotta give a huge shout out to Inamuffin Cup and Fishbin here since we did find a way past this. Muffin recommended dropping a scale or something under the slab and then despawning the slab. But as Fishy found out, it's even simpler than that. If you clear the mud and then make a trip back to Sidon and come back to the slab, you can now move it. As it turns out, if you go far enough away, it'll despawn the constraint that prevented the slab from moving, and going to Sidon is just far enough. As for getting it into the wall, I found that with good angling, you can use rockets to push the slab over the rocks and towards Giotto. From here, I experimented with a lot of things like octobloons, campfires, and other Zonai devices. I eventually came to a realization that I likely wouldn't get this in with just octobloons and I need rockets. That said, positioning a rocket to push the slab in was not easy, but a good friend the Hoverstone came to my aid. If you drop one and then use an octobloon to raise it up, you can get just the right angle for a rocket to launch at the slab. From there, it was just a matter of tedious reattempts until I got lucky enough to time it perfectly and get the slab in. Well that was a nightmare. Good thing we're now free to collect the king scales from Dorafan and... Right, we're supposed to fuse it to an arrow and shoot it through the droplet. While it might seem like a hard stop, I did have some ideas. 
I discovered that it's possible to clip into waterworks early, which, by the way, is a horrible process as you can randomly void out in the water while out of bounds. But I did manage to get in a complete waterworks, however, the terminal refuses to allow interaction until the scale arrow is shot. I even tried the interaction during a blood moon, but that didn't work either. I also tried shooting a scale in midair, throwing one through, and flying one through on a wing. I even went as far as trying to get a construct to fuse one since some have fused arrows. Another idea was to clip out a Ganon via infinitely jumping out of bounds, but unfortunately the game winds up pulling you back in. My final, last ditch effort was to bait a construct to fuse a scale to a weapon, then roll the long throw modifier to chuck it through the droplet, but even that didn't work. So this is our first use of abilities, as not even fusing the scale to a rocket will work. Only the arrow suffices for this droplet. Disappointing, but let's see if the temple itself requires anything. The rest of the quests between fighting and climbing the water temple all can be done easily and without abilities, except for one spot in Waterworks. For one of the rocks, you'd normally ascend, but it's possible to clip out of bounds and blow them up with a bomb from here. Beyond that, the journey up to the temple is completely normal, letting us activate the dungeon and get started on terminals. For Terminal 1, let's talk about the Spinning Tower. If you stand below, it's possible to hit the tower with a splash root, and with just the right timing you can clear the mud off the crystal. With the mud cleared off, we can use a spring to get Link airborne, and using bullet time will make hitting the crystal a trivial task. From here, we can get the terminal unlocked and fill cauldron number 1. For number 2, I chose the one you'd need electricity for. Originally I figured I could use choo-choo jellies and try and chain electricity, but then realized I missed a simple solution. One of the Zonite devices you can spawn is a shock emitter, and this could keep the door open, making Valve 2 completely trivial. For Terminal 3, we need to get this orb up to the next island. My initial thought was Octobloons and arrows, but it didn't seem to move the orb very far. That's okay though, because we still got one of the iconic duo, namely bombs, and they will get it up with a good angle. Once up, we can gust it into place and then Octobloon the gate to lower the water level. The orb should slip in and then Terminal 3 is available to unlock. Terminal 4 is a bit harder than the other three and starts with a fire door with seemingly no way through. It turns out it's possible to drop a hoverstone directly in the fire and from there it can be activated and lifted with Octobloons to make a doorway for a link to go through. The orb on the far side of the room can be thrown across the spikes and then an Octobloon and arrow will get it up. And of course, this one needs to go on a wall, and Octobloon seemed like a massive pain. I actually had quite a good idea here though. With Hoverstones, we can make a platform to about the right height as the hole, and using a bomb, we can tilt them to make a ramp leading the orb straight in. This made it a lot easier than I expected. With all terminals down, now the Muck to Rock provides no issue whatsoever, as we could get into bullet time and finish it off quickly. The four main temples are down, but we're not done yet, as there's one more hidden, which is the Spirit Temple. We went over getting to the Thunderhead Isles in my All Shrines No Abilities video, but essentially if you know the location you can just glide to it without clearing the clouds. Once it's unlocked, the mask here needs to be taken to the depths. After it's activated, we can use the existing wing and one bomb to get into the air, and carry it all the way to Tobio's Chasm. From here it's a straight shot all the way down into the depths, and this is where the Spirit Temple issues really begin. We not only need to slot the mask, but all four other parts too without Ultra Hand. Before we dig into this, I want to give a huge shout out to Fishman as they helped a ton with multiple spots in the Spirit Temple. For the mask, we actually get a bit lucky. By raising a hoverstone and standing on top, it's possible to just directly throw the mask in. Beyond the mask though, we have four depots with four separate limbs and each has its own unique issues. These parts stay in their casing which increases their weight, makes them larger to move, and we gotta get them through some tricky spots. The easiest of these is the right arm. The casing will react to most physic objects, but rockets are probably the easiest to move it into the escalator in front of it. After carrying it up, there's a gap to cross and Octobloons and arrows will easily do the job. From there, we get outside and it's as simple as pushing it along the ground to Monero, which rockets do quite a good job of. Though, be careful of where you shoot it, as some spots like this you can't really fish it back out of. Getting it to Monero is just half the journey though, as we need to slot it with the proper rotation. I experimented a lot and considered using things like hoverstones to prop it up, but in the end, the best setup for each of these is quite simple. Set some campfires down to make an updraft, then attach some octobloons and try to knock it in with arrows. While this is quite a difficult task, I didn't really find anything to make it easier. The starting position of the limbs make a big difference and generally you want to octobloon it when it's in front of its slot. From there, get the proper rotation and then get some height. 
When the limb is lined up, try to knock the top in, then when it seems slotted, press the center and bottom with more arrows. With some persistence and luck, it'll go in, letting us move on to arm number two. Once the casing is dropped, the door ahead can be easily raised and rockets can knock it from the pedestal to the other side. The lava in room 2 may seem like a showstopper, but if we get the case into the lava, it actually doesn't move it. Even better, we can spawn rockets over the lava and then trigger them to push it through. The following section, though, we aren't so lucky. I was never able to just push the casing through this section with a rocket, so instead I essentially opted for octobloons, rockets, and arrows to try and get it through this gap. With enough perseverance and resources, it is possible. Past this lava is another door, but this one doesn't have wheels on it, meaning we need octobloons to open it. That means we need to rocket the casing through while the octobloons are still lifting it. From here, it's a straight shot into the water, which will carry the limb almost all the way to Maneru. The waterway narrows just beside Maneru, and from here the same tricks we've been using to get it out of the water and to Maneru, where the casing will break. Interestingly enough, the right arm is a bit trickier to slot as it's more sensitive to arrow shots, making it easier to over-rotate. But this also makes it easier to knock it in when it's close, clearing limb number two. Halfway there now, but the legs are trickier. First up is the right leg, and just like the first arm, we need octobloons to get it into an elevator. The next room is the unique part of this limb, but it's cleared pretty easily by throwing octobloons at the case and knocking it forward with arrows. After it's up, there's yet another elevator to get it to, but once through that hurdle is a straight stretch to Maneru, and rockets can make the journey quite easily. Slotting the legs is quite a bit different than the arms though, as we get very little time before an octobloon lifts it above the slot. Additionally, for the right leg in particular, it's ultra susceptible to arrows and will move a lot compared to the other limbs when shot with an arrow. This can be advantageous though. With the leg close to its slot, we can octobloon it then immediately catch the updraft. Shot 1 should knock the top of it in and then shot 2 to push the bottom. With a couple more arrows near the center limb, number 3 goes in. One more left and the hardest of all, the left leg. I could say yeah, just octobloon or rocket this into the first elevator, but this limb is significantly heavier than the others for some reason, making it harder to get on the elevator. The weight is especially noticeable once it's up top, but how the rockets don't push it well unless they're directly hitting it. And of course, the second room is trying to get this casing up a wall, and for some reason the octobloons seem to pull it away if you start near the wall. I finally figured out that using a campfire and starting the octobloons away from the wall was the key to success. This won't quite get it high enough though, so more octobloons need to be thrown until it's high enough. From there, it was just entering bullet time and hoping to hit it with enough arrows to get it over the wall. Of course, it still needs more rockets to get it over to Maneru, and this one requires quite a few. With the casing finally open, the attempts to slot it can finally begin. There is a helpful strat to slot it, but I wanted to point out that every time you fail any of these limbs and run out of resources, you need to restart and completely go back through each depot any time you need to reload. And for this limb, that was an issue, because arrows barely push it and getting it lined up is extremely difficult. Once I had it in place though, the strat was the same with octobloons and updrafts. For this limb, I almost entirely just pushed the top and middle and avoided the bottom. Since it's so difficult to move, it didn't rotate a lot, and for some reason hitting the bottom seems to mess up the angle more. All in all, this limb alone took me over 10 hours to slot. And finally, Maneru is built. You'd think this is the last bit of the temple, but we have one more minor impedance. Getting Monero to her secret stone. It turns out that we need to bring her up to the building containing it, but we get stuck at this cliff. Luckily, the solution is quite easy. Drop a hover stone and activate it. Walk Monero on top and then drop an octobloon and get back on top of Monero. After a few octobloons, she should be up to the top and then we can fight the construct by riding Monero and slapping with her arms, throwing bombs, or shooting arrows. With the evil construct down, we finally complete the spirit temple. And with that, the run is done. There is some debate on whether the Hyrule Castle and the final bit with Ganon are dungeons, but even if we were to consider them as one, there's no explicit requirement for abilities in either. So, can you beat every dungeon without abilities? Almost. Our only usage was the one fuse arrow for the water temple. If you've got ideas on how to skip this or make other parts easier, I'd love to hear about them in the comments below. If you haven't seen the first part of this run, which was all shrines with no abilities, you can check it out here. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I'll see you in the next Out of the Box Challenge.